my, uh, our, I think everybody who's here, third, third, right? Third homecoming, Cranes. Everybody does, you guys do a great job with this thing. It keeps getting better every year, but Steve, welcome back home to Detroit. Thanks, Dan. It's a real honor yep. and privilege to be here today. That's great. So, you know, we need you to be a little bit more passionate and enthusiastic, if you could. <laughs> great. So, let me get this right. So, you went to Farmington Hills. You're from Farmington Hills. Go to Detroit Country Day, right? Detroit Country Day. Then you go to Harvard, got into Harvard. Rumor had you have some 800 on the SAT, math, or something like that. Not a bad score. Incorrect rumor since we're resume specific, but okay. I love that Wikipedia keeps saying it. I, I'm going to. Um, and then you go to Harvard and there's a, I don't know, you bump into, what's that guy's name, Bill Gates? What's Bill Gates. A, so how, was he right next to you? Was he your room? What's the real story there? So that my sophomore year in college, I lived in a dorm with a bunch of weird people. Uh, like really good math people, so you understand the nature of the weirdness. And I lived on one end of the hall, Bill lived on the other, and there's a guy who lived about halfway between, he said, you guys are both a little weird, but you like each other. So he pulled us together, kind of match made our friendship, and uh, with Bill drop out, drop back in, drop out of college some more, we stayed friends through, through all of that, and after Microsoft's about five years old, he called and said, hey, look, um, you know, I know you're in school, but blah, blah, blah. Uh, I hope, wish you had a twin brother, he said, uh, and I wound up going to Microsoft. Did he ask you, when he left originally, did he say come on or, or, or no? No. no Didn't he, ask you. Not when he dropped out. It was about two, three years okay. later. He and I had stayed in touch. And, and uh, when the company reached 30 people, it finally needed a business person. And, and I was the man. You were the guy. Now, you had spent a couple years at P&G, is that right? Absolutely. What were you doing there? Uh, I was the uh, brand assistant on Cold Snap Freezer Dessert Maker. <laughs> Stinker. Went down in test market. And I'm still proud of my work on Duncan Hines Brownie Mix. <laughs> is it? One of the high points of my professional career, behind only my caddying jobs at Franklin Hills Country Club. You, I heard, did, did you caddy for Al Taubman at one point? I did caddy for Al Taubman. And good tipper? Was he a good tipper? He was the biggest tipper basically at Franklin Hills in the summer of 1974. No, my first stint there, so it would have been the summer of 71. He was the man. $8.50 if you caddied for Al Taubman. <laughs> That's great. So tell us, so you, you worked your way up Microsoft, become the CEO around the turn of the century, right? Around 2000. 14 years as CEO. Tell us, what were the things you're the most proud of and accomplished, and then what are the one or two things, man, you wish you, you, you learned from it and you're, you're now taking with you? Most, the thing I'm most proud of is the, the culture and the people we put together. When I started in 1980, for no obvious reason, I became the HR department, and we set a focus on people, a hiring practice, a great environment to bring in the same kind of nerdy people that Bill and I had been in college as math guys. And in a sense, that has been a great strength of the company, the great strength uh, of the company. So I would say that's number one. Uh, number two, we were fast on our feet when IBM got a little confused about operating systems. You have to be lucky, but you have to be fast to take the opportunity. That would be number two, because that's sort of the business that put us on the map. And then I personally am pleased. The thing Microsoft actually makes most of its money on now is sending, selling technology to fantastic IT departments like Quicken Loans, a very good Microsoft customer, and uh, building that business, enterprise bills business, is 80% of Microsoft now, and we really built that over the time I was CEO. And data centers, was that? Was that data center software, software, business intelligence. Yeah. These guys run a really, really clever um, set of software to run Quicken Loans. It's, it's really quite amazing. So let me ask you this. Do you guys, you, Bill Gates, when you're there, and others, I mean, when Apple does something or Google does something, you wake up in the morning, you go to work, 
are you like bitching them out? Are you upset? Like, what, give us give us a sense of what happens when any kind of competitor does something. The three things. Number one, do you really think they did something good? Number two, if they did, you say, Ah, Shinola. <laughs> and then the third thing you do is you start telling the press it's not that important because if the press thinks you think it's important, shoot, you're really in trouble. Um, believe me, I have plenty of moments which now people like to throw back in my face when I said, oh no, the iPhone's not going to be important. <laughs> um, long story, uh, I knew it was, but <laughs> suffice it to say that quote will, for sort of an existing mindset, you have to scale up, you've got to get people who can manage bigger teams, be manager of managers, I remember the first time. But there come times when you actually have to learn to do something new. And to me, those are the real inflection points. Microsoft had no capability to sell the approaches to customer service, everything. We worked on that for 20 years before, really, we had a breakthrough, 15 years before we had a breakthrough. When I tell her something, it sets off a stream of tasks, but they're all done on a computer. Why can't I just tell my computer, get me ready for my trip to Detroit? It, it has all the data about who I'm going to see. It knows what I'm going to do. Everything's on my calendar. And, it know, and, and my secretary would know exactly what to do. So the computer getting smarter about learning about the world and about you, that's where I think you're going to see most of the innovation. So that gets you to augmented reality. It gets you to the future of things like Siri and Cortana. It does a whole lot of, of interesting stuff. You mentioned quantum computing. Quantum computing is a big deal, and somebody will be making a lot of money off of it in about 70 years. You think it's Could be accelerated to 50. Um, you think it's that far away, quantum computing? I do. We started a research effort when I was at Microsoft in quantum computing. Yep. And at least for the foreseeable future, the only real business is selling uh, defense contracts. The, quantum computing is a really funny thing because it uses... Quantum and computing and physics means you never really know what's up or where anything is, effectively. You can't know where something is and how fast it's moving. So you'd say, how does that work? Computers have to know yes, no, one, zero, blah, blah, blah. But you, you can actually learn something by these things that bounce around and are imprecise. It takes incredible software, but it also takes cooling materials down to very, very, very cold states. So you have to have these massive freezing chambers, all of which makes it expensive. I know I'm getting long-winded uh, in the short run. Okay. So just for everybody's sake, quickly define quantum computing, because if it is successful, it, it basically is sort of the difference between maybe an abacus to today's most data-full and fastest computers in the world times like a million. Is that right? I mean, it's, it's beyond even what human beings can, can you think. You will have orders of magnitude many, many millions of times more computing power than you have today. And you could say, why do I need that? My PC or my phone's plenty for me. But if you really want to recognize the world and know me and have essentially artificial intelligence, believe me, software people will figure out how to use the incredible new computing power yeah. that quantum gives us. If you get bored late at night, like sometimes I do, two in the morning, go on to YouTube, Dive into quantum computing with your headphones on. It's a whole different level of consciousness, okay? Um, let's, let's jump to one more part of your business, and then we're going to talk about Detroit a little bit. So you retired just a couple years ago, and you decided to do something as crazy as buy an NBA team, for a lot of money, by the way, um, and in a situation over there. I, I hope that make the Cavaliers appreciate. Yeah, and we, I know you're never going to sell it, so who cares? Yeah, we were, we're, we're very appreciative. but. You, you go ahead and you have a very tough situation to navigate there. It was unusual, but, you know, commissioners literally making an owner sell the team to you. How did that whole process work, and are you happy you did it? First, I'm, I'm like, pinch me. I'm so excited I did it. It's just, it is cool to own a sports team. It is cool beyond belief, I, I have to tell you. Depends on the year, let me tell you. Pardon me? Depends on the year. We have not had the kind of year that would depress me, and you yeah. can tell me about that later. I, Let I, me I, stay childlike in my enthusiasm. You can do that. 
Uh, so it, it, look, I, I, I was basically sort of busy when the Seattle Supersonics were up for sale and wound up moving out of our town. I regretted that once I retired, and I went to see the commissioner of the NBA and said, hey, you know, I'm interested. How about a team back in Seattle? Well, we, we had already tried a group of us to get the Sacramento team to move to Seattle, and the league really doesn't want teams to move. They want to honor the cities where they are. So I said to the commissioner, you know, what do I do? He says, well, get used to being in some other city. Milwaukee was for sale at the time. He said, maybe you should fly to Milwaukee and take a look around. And I said, okay, Milwaukee, okay. And I said, how about like some of those teams that are a little closer to Seattle? And I said, you know, the people who own the Clippers, Sterling, he's pretty old. And he said, he may be old, he'll never sell. I said, why don't I just go have dinner with him? He said, don't have dinner with him. Really? Don't. You won't want to. And then the Clippers, you know, the whole thing comes down, Sterling, racism, and my son calls me. My son's in college. College kids don't get up and call you at 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning. Dad, this is your chance. Take it. Well, I don't even know what to do. There's nobody really selling the team. All the stuff's playing out with the commissioner. But I know a guy named Michael Eisner who ran Disney. And he's had season tickets next to the Sterlings for 25 years. And finally, he figures out a way to introduce me to Shelly Sterling. Uh, I asked her, what should I do? She says, why don't you just give me a number on the phone? I said, how about I come meet with you or something like that? And I think they decided I was the best buyer because most of them were large groups of people and there was going to be a big lawsuit with the NBA, with the wife, da 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 and I kind of hung in there, kind of a roller coaster ride as the lawsuits sort of flailed left and right. And then I got a chance to write my check. And you did it, and it's been the third season you just had? This will be my third season, yeah. And, and you spent time between LA and Seattle, and I'll, I'd love to get even more into the NBA, but you know what? You know, I'm getting the sign here a little bit, and we got five or, five or seven minutes or something left, so I want to talk about Detroit. Yeah. So you, you were away from Detroit for many, many years, actually since pretty much high school. We met about three, four years ago, and we, we walked through the city. You were still with Microsoft at the time. And I know, you know Mary has been pushing for you to, to come here and, and others and spend more. Do you have, do you have family here still? Uh, all of my uh, relatives, except my sister and my nuclear family, still live here. Okay. It's small, but all here. And, and now here you are, and you've taken an interest, you and your wife, Connie, you've taken an interest in, in uh, what you're calling intergenerational poverty. So maybe give everybody just a, because you could do a lot of things with the kind of wealth you've built. And you're, you're, you told me this afternoon you're focusing on this specific issue among a couple others. Give everybody a flavor of what that means to you and why you chose that. Yeah. Uh, my wife, Connie, has been working in issues that are sort of around child welfare, uh, primarily in the Northwest for about 10 years. Uh, I retire, and we're brainstorming what we do, and as she's describing sort of what's going on with child welfare, I'm also doing just sort of separately because I'm a mathy, CPA-ish type guy. I'm trying to figure out what the government takes in, what does it spend, what does it do, is it effective? and the thing that became clear from what my wife's talking about and what you see, government's actually making progress on a lot of things, but it doesn't really make progress on the lives of certain children who are born into situations where the probability that their life is any better than their parents is very low. There are many people who are born poor who, who actually still have an opportunity to do well, but there are certain situations and you'll find a lot of them in, as Dan said to me earlier, urban corridors, where the situation is dysfunctional. You could say it's all about the school, but the home life is, is, is distressed and inadequate and dysfunctional. People are getting evicted from their homes. They're moving. They have no stability. There's no place to, to study at night. Their parents aren't, aren't readers. They don't start reading. They're behind grade level by kindergarten. So the thing we've got interested in is how do we support 
community organizations, government work, not-for-profits that are really focused in on kids and their parents, because you can't ignore the parents if you're after the kids, and hopefully those organizations with support we might give them can give a kid instead of maybe a 30% of chance, of, or 10% chance of doing better than their parents, give them a 40 or 50% chance piece. At the end of the day, it's kind of statistical. You're not going to do well for everybody. Yeah, so you know, Warren Buffett said the exact same thing you did in, in one of the interviews, I think we might have been here even a couple years ago, that the single biggest statistic to, to predict success you know, there's two of them, but one of them is, you know, who, where you grow, where, who, where were you born, where did you grow up? The second, how old were you when you started your company? If you were an entrepreneur, but, but the big one is what you're saying, and, and so, when you think of Detroit and, and what you may, may get involved with, and, and when you think of all the things that you're, you're considering, how much better, or how does it feel, giving away money, watching people do things on the nonprofit side when you've been in the profit side all these years? How much, how is that different for you personally? How does that feel? Anything you do with philanthropy and giving shares essentially something with business. You are trying to measure outcomes. It's not profit, but you're trying to actually measure outcomes. It's harder, uh, particularly in social services and helping kids, it's harder to measure. It's a point my wife Connie's made a lot. You know, you're the tech guy, help us with the data infrastructure that's really going to let us measure this stuff. But in a sense, it's a similar kind of thought process. Here's a problem. Here's an ecosystem of people who care about the problem. How do you apply resources in a way that helps people get outcomes, and how do you measure those? And I, I really kind of enjoy it. It's very frustrating. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, we don't do anything directly. We work through, you know, organizations that we support who knows whether you, you can't predict this is a problem almost by definition. We care about intergenerational poverty. The definition almost is this is a tough problem that doesn't get fixed over the years. But we are really enjoying trying to support those kinds of organizations and communities. So, so you know, Steve, and most people who are entrepreneurs know this as well, you get ahead through failing, right? So you're going to fail at things, either big things, small things, learn, adjust, and, and move forward. In the nonprofit world, people are using generally other people's money, whether it's a government or private or foundation money, less probably hesitant to fail. Is that a problem in, in getting ahead because they're using others' money and they can't really, you know, can't fail with someone else's money, at least most cases? I, I think that's, that's probably right. In a sense, one of the things that I think is an asset for us bec we, because we are blessed with so much resource is we can invest in things that are higher risk attempts and where the money might well fail, but it's worth taking the shot. And I think, uh, you know, in the world of venture capital, I'm not sure we're exactly, you know, series, you know, uh, seed money, but we'd really like to help with, think of it as the Series A financing that can really help a germ of an idea take off. And if it doesn't, we're willing to live with that risk. Okay. Great, great insight. I'm, I'm getting, I think I'm, am I supposed to go to Q&A? Q, we're doing, okay, so I've been told that we're gonna do a, a, a Q&A for Steve Ballmer. I could interview you probably for three more hours and have fun doing it. I, um, but, a, I do wanna have, a, I do wanna have a chance to talk a little bit about Detroit, so somebody better ask a question or, or I'll add live it. Mr. Baum, Mr. Bomber. Uh, I have a question for you. In May, Facebook and Microsoft announced a joint venture with Telefonica de España to build two cables from Virginia to Spain for the future growth in communications. That's 4,000 miles under the ocean, 8,000 together. It's a $200 million investment. When I was here in May talking to the heads of nonprofit charter schools, I asked them how many kids in the city of Detroit have access to the internet. Nobody knows, there's no factual data. But their best guess was 60 to 70 percent of kids in the city of Detroit do not have access to the internet when they go home. From your perspective, what can technology companies, the talent in this room, the financial capital sitting in this room, what can we do to open up the internet to this next generation of kids coming up? 
I think there's a unique opportunity. We spent some uh, time today with uh, folks in the mayor's office who are focused in on economic development and uh, some of the housing stuff we had a chance to talk to Dan about as well. But as the city looks to rebuild not just downtown, et cetera, midtown, but gets into the neighborhoods, one of the questions people absolutely should look at is, what do we do with fiber? Should it be part of what we do to put essentially internet hotspots in these neighborhoods to make the internet more accessible? Uh, it's not gonna be done in some way where government's just dumping money. And philanthropy can't pay for it either because we're talking about people having internet for all time. It is important. The phone is a source of internet for even kids who are less affluent, not as good as we'd like, but you can't do your homework on a phone. So the question is how does broadband and PC slash tablet type technology really help? I do think it's a big deal. And just for, for the record, there is something here called rocket fiber that, that we invested in as wiring up downtown, midtown, and then going into the neighborhoods. Same stuff that Google had in Kansas City and others. Uh, and some neighborhoods are even online already now and gonna be going into schools and city buildings and things like that. And there's others besides rocket fiber that are, that are moving that, but that's a, a very important point uh, to make sure it all happens. Hi, Steve. I did a summer in Redmond as an MBA intern, so thank you. One of my oldest friends from Grayling, Michigan has been at Microsoft for 20 years and loves it, and I think it's a great company. But I will give you the question you want, which is, what do you think about Detroit, and what do you want to do in Detroit? How do you want to contribute? I have to say I'm very fired up today about Detroit. Um, I, I get back probably twice a year. You know, family stuff. I was talking to uh, Jeff and I were talking earlier. More funerals, less weddings than we'd like. It's got to switch around here. We'd like to do more weddings than funerals. But, you know, I get back. I have cousins here. And frankly, when I come back, I mostly have seen and, and have forced myself to look at the blighted part of Detroit. And, you know, people have talked to me, yeah, things are going on downtown. Dan got me fired up about downtown when we first met. But to me, downtown's important, but, you know, my, my grandfather grew up, uh, lived over on Grand River. My mom was born on 12th Street. My grandfather moved to McNichols between Greenfield and Southfield. The places my family lived, are still blighted. And that was kind of where I would visit uh, and, and look back in Detroit. Uh, I have cousins who are out in the suburbs. I think probably everybody knows people in the suburbs who still haven't given Detroit a second look, particularly if they're more my age as opposed to younger, uh, younger folks. And, you know, I just haven't, haven't fully bought in and believed. Today it's different. To this day, I mean literally, Today, seeing what's happened just in downtown since I was here last, we went up with uh, folks from the mayor's office and looked at what's going on at Livernoy and McNichols where they have a big plan to do a neighborhood redevelopment. And I have to say, I'm charged up. I, I am a believer. I actually think the things people are talking about, I actually think they're going to happen. Or they could happen. They could happen. They could happen. As soon as you say it can happen, you're not, you're not going to work hard enough. So they could happen. It's going to still work hard. <laughs> Just incredible energy and, and, and intelligence and creativity to make it happen. Uh, but I was excited. And certainly as we think about the kind of stuff we're doing, primarily now focused in, in Seattle, in LA, and things that are national, we'll keep our eyes just a little wider open on old Detroit. Because I have my heart, look, I live in Seattle, and I think of myself as Seattleite. I own a basketball team in L.A., Glue Clips. But my, you know, this is my home. This is where I grew up. This is in me here. You know, um, I will tell everybody that Steve is as honest as possible, because when we took him three, four years ago around, you know, he was like, yeah, it's nice, there's some things going on, but, I, you know, man, you got a long, I don't know, man, a long way to go here. So it was really good to hear that you, you you're a buyer today, and that's good news for everybody here, for sure. Do we have any more time for more questions? Uh, hi, uh, my name is Sultan Sharif. Uh, I just want to thank you. It's been really inspiring hearing you speak. I'm from Inkster, Michigan, originally. I, uh, I was one of those kids, like you're describing. I went to University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. 
and then uh, then eventually moved to LA, go Clips. And then, uh, and now I'm back running a youth program, but I'm a social entrepreneur, and so I wanted to ask you, I'm running into a lot of issues where, you know, Einstein once said you can't solve the world's problems by the same way of thinking that created them. And so as this kid from Inkster, Michigan, I think differently than a lot of the people who are writing the checks to solve these issues. So I have this unique perspective where I'm coming from the place that they're trying to address, but I communicate differently than a lot of those folks because I'm coming from a different perspective. So you talked earlier about you know every company having its like one trick idea, two trick, and so in social entrepreneurship we have like three tricks. And so a lot of times I find it really hard to communicate with folks who say that they want to address these issues, but they say that with this idea that they know the best way to address those issues, when if you're coming from the place with those issues, they often don't regard your perspective with the same level of value. So I wonder how do you suggest, with every, all the excitement happening around Detroit, how do you suggest that people who are coming from the communities, from the neighborhoods, connect with those that want to reinvest and support? Okay, for, first let me, let me cop to not being an expert in any topic in this discussion. You know, as I said, I've been spending the last year with my wife on this stuff, not the last 10 years, so I'm learning. The one observation I'd make, and again, take it for what it's worth, is there are interesting opportunities to do things a little differently in Detroit because of, you know, the, the expression is, you never want to waste a good crisis. Detroit's coming from a good crisis. Uh, when you take down blighted homes, you can really... You can really rethink. You can rethink the geography. You can rethink service delivery. You almost have to, given you know where Detroit's been, where the police services, social services, the public school system is. In a way, I think the both the physical freedom, because the city needs to be redeveloped from an uh, you know housing and infrastructure perspective, but you, you can do more as long as you're out in the communities, really working, really soliciting opinions. There's more of a chance to do what I would call out-of-the-box thinking, if I could characterize what I think I heard you saying. And I hope, uh, you know, sort of soup to nuts, not just on housing and infrastructure and safety, but on education and social services and how to support kids through the education system. I think there's an opportunity to think differently, and I hope leaders in the not-for-profit uh, uh, space here in Detroit pick that cry up and work well with the folks who are already working on the physical side. I don't know if I answered your question, but I had a whole lot of fun thinking that through. Yes, sir. Hard to see. Is there any more questions do we have in the back? To start to, it's hard for us to see up here, so just start talking if you have a microphone. Thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm so excited to be home um, in Detroit. Um, I'm, rich, I'm originally from Detroit, um, grew up here, went to a, a Central High School, um, been living in Atlanta and Washington, D.C. for many years. But when I got this invitation here, I was so excited. I have a community loan fund where we work on redevelopment projects. I'm working on the Turner Field project in Atlanta, Georgia right now where we are redeveloping um, the old Olympic Stadium into a redevelopment community there. But when I got this phone call and email for Detroit, it was like my heart. As you mentioned, uh, Michael and everyone else and Dan, this is like my home. I grew up on Blaine and went to the, uh, Detroit Central. But my question is, is that during this redevelopment stage, how are we going to get the community involved? Because on each of my projects that I work with, I made sure that we work with the people in the community to find ways to make sure they participate in the redevelopment and into the projects and also benefit from what's going on in the community. As we reach outside of um, Midtown and downtown, Detroit, how can we just reach out farther and make sure we create jobs and get those people that are in need job training and make sure they participate in our project, what we're doing. 
I think that's something that would be very important for people who live here every day to figure out. There's no question that community involvement is, you know, a thousand percent essential. You, you know this better than I. Dan would know better than I what's going on. The thing, uh, certainly one of the tenets my wife and I really believe in is we shouldn't support anything that goes counter what, to what the communities are looking for. That's why really having community support, whether it's community uh, uh, organizing groups or not-for-profits that are deeply embedded in the community, those things are really required. And you know, folks like us can support them, but they really have to provide the leadership in conjunction with government uh, for a plan. Really hard to understand how that's gonna happen, but where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, I, I will say, I've said this since day one, you're never going to be able to sustain the growth of downtown and midtown if the neighborhoods aren't also growing and improving and the community is not getting involved. It's just not going to happen. But it is, it is happening. Uh, there's four big sort of categories, the way we look at it anyways, when you look at Detroit as far as the challenges. I mean, you have blight, you have jobs, you have education and crime. Three of those four categories are, are definitely pointing the right way. I mean, I think that, you know, the mayor with, with the blight, without removing the blight, I don't think you even have a shot, frankly, at the other three in, in the neighborhoods and in the surrounding commercial districts. So 11,000 homes have been taken down in the last year and a half, two years. Crime is down all over the city, downtown and in, and in the uh, neighborhoods. Um, and unemployment is down. Now education, we're still, I think, as a community addressing. Um, I think there's a lot of people doing a lot of really good things in it, but it, I think everyone would probably agree that's the biggest place that, that needs the most focus. And it, it, if you look backwards from where we were in any neighborhood almost, almost any neighborhood in Detroit, four years ago, three years ago, five years ago, six years ago to today, some progress is big, some is smaller, but we're moving in the right direction. And we, we need to keep, keep going with those kinds of, of thoughts and philosophy and, and, and make sure that you're not just, you know, contain whatever, whatever project we do, we, we try you know, there's all kinds of initiatives uh, in, in, to involve um, hiring in the neighbors. And we, our organization's hired, you know, 3,500 people who lived in Detroit before we got here as full-time jobs. A lot of others have, have done big numbers here, too. And it, it, to me, it's once the crime and the blight is done, you know, you got to have jobs for people, whether it's downtown, whether it's midtown, whether it's a neighbor. It starts with jobs. We have to have the jobs. Uh, and, and I think we're moving in the right direction. We just need to create wealth and create jobs, entrepreneurial activity, big companies, everything and everybody. The only thing I'd add, Dan talked about everything, this education thing is big. And particularly as the schools come back into sort of local, you know, sort of local management, so to speak, not only rethinking the schools, but think, rethinking all of the other supports around these kids, that is, you know, are their mothers well prepared to have them? Do they get the right kind of early education? Are there the right sort of supports when they first get into school? Are there decent after school programs? There's much, much more, but sort of, if you will, uh, from, from cradle to career, it's not just the education, it's all that goes around it that's going to have to be really worked out in the communities, in the neighborhoods. That's not going to be able to necessarily be done all centrally. So I agree with you, and there'll be a new frontier, I think, required for community involvement as the schools morph back, if you will, to, to really being managed locally uh, now that some of the financial issues have been largely put to rest, as I understand. A uh, gentleman says that cannot be done without resources. I agree with that, but the resources have to know where to be applied, and that's so. There's a funny bootstrap, and you know, I hope I hope that gets going pretty quickly here in Detroit. So, Mary, one more question, or are we done? One more, we got one more question right here, I guess. Gary Shapiro, hi Dan Hester. Uh, you guys are marketing geniuses. What is the message for Detroit to the rest of the world? Because right now, when I travel around the country and the world, I hear not good things. Detroit has a reputation that that city's bankrupt. What is the message and what are the three proof points? 
What was, I didn't hear the last piece. I'm sorry. The, the, the proof points. Okay. The three, like, everyone in this room is an ambassador for Detroit. And there should be a consistent message, and there isn't. What do you think it should be? I mean, uh, Dan's going to take it because, dude, I've been back here one day looking around. I'm not going to try to take that on. Educate me, my man. The message to, well, I, I think number one message is that Detroit's a great place to invest and do business because, you know, that's how you sustain things for the long run, that it's a great place, to, and it is. I can just tell you, I mean, this doesn't go just to our family businesses, but, you know, talking to, to everybody, that does business in Detroit, people are shocked. I, I never get the story the other way around. You know, I got here, I thought it was gonna be much better than it is, and it really, I, I just don't hear that. I don't hear from small merchants. I don't hear from people who come and are, are gonna even open up a, a school or do this or do that, or, you know, retailers or office or, or technology or service businesses. Everyone is always, man, they can't believe it, and we keep gaining momentum. And so, you know, if you're looking for a place to do business, you know, Detroit, and Michigan, but Detroit particularly is, it's a, it's one of the best places for a lot of reasons, you know, having businesses in different parts of the country, education system, the, the infrastructure is great here. I mean, the, the, uh, the uh, prices of, of price of living compared to other areas. And then there's a real, something you can't measure is just the passion and the, the heart and the resilience of this of this city. It, it's shocking every, if you put anybody here in a time machine three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, eight years ago, and showed them where we are today, I don't think most people would believe you. And I think it's gonna be just as, as much, if not even more, sort of geometrically as we go into the future. That's my belief. You know, they say part of the deal with the Detroit homecoming is go home and say things are going well in Detroit. I will. And, the, you know, what I'll do, there's super smart people working on the problems. That's impressive. There's clear progress, at least I've seen, you know, I don't know how to characterize it. Look at the buildings, look at the cranes, look at the people. They're walking on the streets. People say, oh, I'm surprised. Yeah, that looks different than what I remember. So, you know, I, I would take that as a way to describe to people why I go home from Detroit Homecoming. Uh, excited and the community seems rallied around this in a way that at least different than you know there was always somebody bringing Detroit back even when I lived here 60s 70s you know that's okay so next guy's bringing back Detroit but but it, it's it's happening and the whole community seems far more energized around it uh, than when I was a kid so those would be I'm not saying they're proof points but the things I'm gonna say when I leave uh, because I got my homework from the Detroit Homecoming guys. Go forth and say good things. Governor Snyder said it. Mary Kramer said it. That's what I'm going to say. And uh, thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Cranes. And uh, that's our job. We're done. Thank you. Okay.